Many leaders see testing as the way out of this dark and sporadic tunnel of coronavirus lockdowns. The thinking being that if you can catch someone before they spread the virus, then you can slow and even stop the pandemic. In Austria, the government is planning a mass testing campaign. Here, a bike courier drops off tests at apartments in Vienna. He'll be back in the evening to collect the samples to be tested. But not every test is created equal, and the timing of tests is also crucial. Getting to someone before they're infectious can make or break a contact tracing campaign. A mass testing programme in northern Italy has identified over 3,000 coronavirus cases. Now, many of those people had no idea that they had COVID-19. Testing can clearly be a powerful tool for combating the spread of the virus, but what tests you do and where is key. We report from a hospital in Berlin. A coronavirus test to make sure this patient's not infected, ahead of her operation in a few days' time. It doesn't hurt exactly, but it's very unpleasant. It feels like the swab is poking around in your brain. The test is obligatory to protect other patients and staff at hospitals like this one in Berlin. But many people in Germany would like the chance to be tested more regularly. It would be good if we could use the tests to make things like travelling easier, to be a bit safer. That doesn't look likely any time soon. With testing capacity at its limits, the government is trying to ease the pressure on overworked labs. Even some hospitals are shifting away from the more reliable PCR tests, instead using the faster, cheaper antigen tests to check their staff for the virus. The advantage of rapid tests is that we get a result within 30 minutes. It's relatively reliable and a relatively easy testing system. But on the other hand, the disadvantage is that we know the rapid tests are slightly less sensitive to the virus. The PCR test is the gold standard. It's more precise than the rapid test. It's a fine balance between what's reliable and what's practical. But the rapid tests come with their challenges too. In Germany, they can only be administered by a trained health worker. That costs time and money and means people can't test themselves at home. Nurse Eve Bormann understands the dilemma. As hospital staff, of course we would have liked to keep using the PCR tests because they're more sensitive. But I understand that the labs are at their limit and we need the PCRs more urgently for the patients. When they arrive with symptoms, then we have to know fast but for sure whether they really have coronavirus or not. Bormann gets tested once every two weeks. Enough to feel safe, he says. But it's clear any hopes testing could be rolled out on a broader scale will have to wait. For many, that means a test of patients instead. Now, there are three key types of tests being carried out on citizens around the world at the moment. The first test for a past infection is called an antibody test or a serological test. A blood sample is needed for this test. It's then analysed on the existence of antibodies. These are produced by our bodies when they face an infection and can be detected once it's over. The other two tests look out for an ongoing infection with SARS-CoV-2. The first of these is the antigen test. It needs a sample of saliva or throat tissue, which can then be analysed for the proteins that sit on the outside of the coronavirus. These tests can give results quickly, but they're not as precise as the PCR test. For the PCR test, you also need saliva or throat tissue. But this time, it's tested for the virus's genome, which is known as RNA. The PCR test is the most reliable one, but in many cases, it needs more time to be analysed. Now, I've been speaking to Evangelos Kotsopoulos from ALM, the association that represents over 200 accredited laboratories here in Germany. I asked him why, when we have these more accurate PCR tests, we still need another type of test for COVID-19. The less accurate one, you mean the antigen test? Well, it's a, yeah. a trade-off, I guess, between speed and accuracy. We have multiple settings in patient care where we cannot wait five, six, seven, or even 24 hours for a test result. So take someone who is um, admitted to hospital in an emergency setting, for example, 
or in, in aged care, in, a, in an old people's home, someone uh, is swapped because he develops a high fever overnight, you need a response very, very fast. And in such settings, it may be acceptable to work with a little bit less accuracy and less sensitivity. And that's how these tests have been designed as well. So tests also have a package insert, uh, like a drug, like a prescription drug. And it's very clear that these tests have been designed to detect virus in people who are symptomatic and within a certain time window. And that also gives you the answer where these tests are not extremely good at the moment, and that's in broad-based screening, where people are generally asymptomatic, they look and feel healthy, but where they could still be infected. And with these people, antigen and especially the rapid tests do not have a very high sensitivity, and we recommend that PCR testing should be done instead. We're increasingly seeing mass testing programs being carried out in various parts of the world. Is that an effective way of actually defeating coronavirus? Or is it just telling you where it is? Well, it's a, it's a different quality of a program. It's not the continuous permanent screening and track and trace program we currently do, a broad based right around the country. However, it, it has its purpose too. It basically shines a spotlight into a part of the population at a certain point in time and tells us how many infected people might there be. The, the trouble with that is a little bit that antigen tests again are used. And if the prevalence in the population of the disease is very low, like we have now seen in Northern Italy over this past weekend, the positive rate there was below 1%, the risk of false positive and false negative results is very, very high. And we also see the problem that a negative uh, result could give some false certainty because people can infect uh, or get infected pretty quickly after they had a test taken. Uh, but with a negative result, they might feel um, safe and everything's fine and they go back doing what uh, they like doing, which is not quite the case. So we have to be careful with these results, but it gives us interesting statistics to see how many people might be infected within a certain population group. If you wanted to wipe out the virus with this, you would have to repeat it every day and right. you would have to repeat well, the entire population, and that's, of course, not possible. Yeah, it's a big enough feat getting those people tested once, isn't it? Uh, but antibody tests, so testing whether someone has had coronavirus in the past, why is that useful, particularly when we don't know how long or even if that does make you immune? Well, that's precisely the point. So, and that's also why it's not being applied very much at the moment. So when you know someone has had the infection, a person has tested positive through the PCR test, has perhaps even been admitted to hospital, it is interesting to track the antibody developments. There are different types of antibodies which build over time, some very quickly, within hours, when our immune system ramps up to fight an intruder, let's say, some only develop over time and then stay. And so it's very interesting to measure in confirmed positive cases how long do antibodies stay, which type of antibodies build over which period of time. But for the current fighting of the pandemic, this is not a very relevant information. We need to know who is infected right now and who has to be isolated and put into quarantine. The antibody test doesn't help us with that. Evangelos Kotsopoulos from ALM, thank you so much for joining us on the COVID-19 special. You're welcome, thank you. And now it's the part of the programme where you get to ask the questions to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. If you're diagnosed with COVID-19 and are recovering at home, what measures should you take to prevent your family from catching it as well? The last thing you want to do if you catch COVID-19 is give it to your friends or, or family. Unfortunately, um, that can prove challenging if you live in the same household. Um, on the positive side, the evidence we have so far indicates that after your symptoms appear, um, with every day that passes, you'll likely grow less infectious. Uh, though it's still grinding its way through studies, at least currently, we think that maximum infectiousness hits around the first day that you show symptoms, if not before. So if you tested positive after you developed symptoms and are now convalescing at home and the people around you have tested negative, 
then the likelihood you'll infect them should, as a rule, drop by the day. Um, here's what authorities recommend you do. First, uh, no visitors, of course, and both you and caregivers should wear masks in any interactions. Even if it's hard, um, stay as isolated as you possibly can, preferably in your own room with a window that can remain open if temperatures permit it, um, door closed. Try to only eat there as well. A dedicated set of silverware and plates is a good idea. Um, if you have the option in your home of, of multiple bathrooms and toilets, then dedicate one to your use. Uh, limit contact with caregivers. If at all possible, uh, they really shouldn't belong to a high-risk group. Um, they'll need to disinfect regularly. Uh, leave any dirty laundry or bed linens unwashed for as long as possible. And finally, uh, don't forget that caregivers will also need to quarantine for as long as health authorities require, even if that means long after your own symptoms have improved. And you can submit a question for Derek through our YouTube channel. We have just enough time to bring you the latest development in the race to get a coronavirus vaccine ready for distribution. Scientists at Oxford University working alongside pharmaceuticals firm AstraZeneca say trials show that their vaccine candidate is 70% effective, but that is thought to rise as high as 90% when one and a half doses are given. That is lower than the percentages given by Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna. However, the Oxford vaccine is cheaper to produce and it's easier to store.